resistance is futile. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Tea with Phil and Jen. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Mr. Phil Rushworth. As many of you know, Phil was recently on his very first tea trip to China, and as such, must have some special moments. So, without further ado, let's chat with Phil. Right, that's a great question. Favorite food? So we had a lot of really delicious food on this trip,、uh, and to pick a favorite is、uh, a little bit tricky. But I think I can do it.、Um, but just to mention some of the food that almost made the list but didn't quite make the list, when we were visiting the、uh, producers, the freshness of the food was absolutely astounding. Most of the dishes I couldn't give them a name. I don't have no idea what I was eating half of the time, but it was freshly picked that day. In some cases, freshly slaughtered that day,、um, cooked in generally lard,、uh, just delicious. It's hard to explain how fresh and flavorful the food was, and it was just ex- just exciting to be there. However, my favorite dish came from the city、uh, when we were in Chengdu. We asked the、uh, the maitre d' or whoever was at the front desk of the hotel. Uh, where can we get some good noodles? And they said across the street, and that's where we went. And we had some really good、uh, dan dan mian, which is a really traditional Sichuan noodle dish. And boy, did I love that! Favorite attraction? Yeah, I pretty much have two that were on my like favorite list for this trip. We visited Xi'an. Uh, and we visited the Terracotta Soldiers, very well-known tourist attraction globally, one of the wonders of the world. And when I was there, it was clear why that is. I mean, the scope, the massiveness of that project is just astounding.、Um, sort of the reverent nature of the attraction is quite gripping. And I was very impressed with sort of the. The cultural responsibility that the Chinese are taking towards unearthing the terracotta soldiers, and basically what I mean by that is they have pretty much halted the excavation of these soldiers because、uh, when they were made, they were made with、uh, they were painted in very vibrant colors, which was a big deal at the time, and when they unearth them, these colors oxidize very rapidly and become just basically they look like terracotta. They're lost forever. And they want to wait until there's sufficient technology available that they can preserve these colors while they unearth them. So they basically halted the unearthing process. And I just think that's、uh, that's wonderful that they've that they can exhibit that degree of restraint with something so profoundly amazing. So good on them. The other one was、uh, more related to tea and a little bit hits a little bit closer to home for me. And that was our visit to the top of Mengdingshan in Mengding, obviously, where the first、uh, cultivated tea garden exists. It was wonderful, so serene and peaceful at the top of that mountain.、Uh, Jenny, Jen, and I were at the top quite early in the morning, and we had the garden basically all to ourselves, and it was just wonderful. It, there's twelve plants inside a, an ancient stone fence. So、uh, one of the things Mengding is famous for is it's the first place where tea was actually cultivated by people, and this is the garden where that happened.、Um, these aren't the original seven bushes, but there were originally these seven bushes here. And actually, the concept of Qingming being a precious time for tea comes from here. This is where the、um, these bushes were each harvested. Only twelve buds from each of the seven bushes was harvested. And that was made into a tribute tea for the emperor,、um, so that he could give that to his ancestors at Qingming. So, and this lion here, or tiger at the top, guards the garden. So you better not try to get some tea from there. Of course, they're not the original plants, but it was interesting to learn that the provider we were visiting was part of the replanting process of that very garden. So he's. You know, he's someone in that community to be invited to participate in that activity. And we visited a couple shrines at the top of the mountains. We obviously took the the view was stunning.
it was just a really great, honestly, it was a great tea time because of the garden. It was some great family time for me too with my mother-in-law and my beautiful wife. Right, favorite tea. So this is a hard one. We drank a lot of tea on the, uh, on the trip. And probably if you ask me strictly for the tea, uh, for the tea quality, if I had a favorite, it was probably a train, uh, sorry, a tea we had on a train or in an airport somewhere because Jan Lee was pulling out some incredible tea all the time. But I'm going to restrict the answer to basically be among the teas at the mountains we visited. They were all great. Uh, I mean, being able to taste the leaf from the plant, smell and taste the tea at varying stages of the process, and to drink it right after it's processed is really an educational experience. Um, but my favorite tea, like the yellow tea at Meng Dingshan was great. I loved it. Uh, I also loved the Puar from Pa Sha, but my favorite had to be the, uh, and I'm not just saying this because it's on the website, but it had to be the Gu Shu Danzhu from Zhanglang village. Uh, that tea had a real lingering quality and even though it's fresh, it had a softness that was uh, just profound. It was just a wonderful tea to drink. And that would be my favorite tea of this trip. Yeah, the trip is full of memories. Of course, uh, some good and some bad. Uh, um, I got sick at the end of the trip, so that was a little bit bad. But my fondest memory was the, um, we stayed overnight with the producers. They're in fairly remote locations. So um, in Yunnan, they were in very remote locations. So we stayed with them in Zhanglang Mountain. Uh, the night we slept overnight there, there was a huge thunderstorm um, that night. And it was... Uh, it was remarkable. Uh, the wind was howling through the jungle trees. The thunder was clapping. There was flashes of lightning. And the roofs of the drying houses, so that they have drying houses made of sort of a corrugated see-through plastic so that they can, uh, I guess, be warm. And also some of the roofs are made of corrugated steel. And when the wind would blow, these roofs would actually rattle sort of emulating that thunder sound. If you know what a large sheet of plastic or paper sounds like, I mean, it was, it was, it was impressive. I actually, it woke me up several times. So I actually flipped on a uh, audio recording device. I hopefully have some audio of it. It was just phenomenal. Good morning. Morning. <laughs> so it's um, all bright early here. It's in, a little um, misty. We had a big rain and I wind, think that was a storm. Windstorm, yeah. Like the uh, the roofs were shaking, so it sounded like thunder, but it metal thunder. Anyway, um, what an experience. And we could hear uh, the trees like shaking, shaking. It's and the wind really blowing loud. through the trees. The odd animal call. Yeah, I yeah. have some sounds. Maybe we'll put some in. The local says it's a kind of a normal, but I was like, oh, I hope the roof stays. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes it got pretty loud. Yeah. <laughs> to be in the jungle with the sounds were foreign. Even the sound, the way the rain sounded was different for me. It was just something spectacular. Yeah, that was probably my fondest memory. Oh boy, lessons learned. Well, again, relating back to that thunderstorm I talked about, uh, the next morning when we woke up, it was quite brisk on the mountain. Now. Being a Canadian, I'm pretty proud of my ability to withstand cool temperatures. I mean, around here in late February, March, once it's about, if we hit 10 degrees, boom, we're in t-shirts. We don't care. That's about like 40 degrees Fahrenheit for the Americans in the audience. So we're, we're all about going out in what other people think is cold and being perfectly comfortable. However, on the mountain, the air is different. The humidity is different. You know, the air is a bit thin and I was told, you know, to keep warm, didn't listen, 
when you're on a tea trip, you want to keep warm, you want to stay healthy. I ended up getting a little bit sick because of that. And, and it, you know, that was probably my uh, biggest lesson learned on one hand. On another hand, more related to tea and a little bit more positive uh, was being able to like there was just a ton of tea knowledge gained. Uh, walking through the uh, fields with Jian Li and Jen, learning about uh, how how to how to detect good good cultivation and good environments for tea, tasting tea right off the bush, and then subsequently tasting the finished product. Very enlightening. Tasting tea made by the same producer, but tea from Garden A and tea from Garden B, and tasting those differences. These are differences that are really, or these are learnings that are hard to articulate, at least for me, but they're really profound, very, uh, very excellent experience, and I'm definitely looking forward to more of that. Probably one of the most enlightening things that I learned on this trip as well was, or just one of the most uh, all around enlightening experiences for me was to watch Jian Li in action and to see really what a tea consultant does. So I've, I've been in the business for about four years. Uh, I've been interacting with customers, drinking tea and learning about tea at the very end of the process. And I've told tons of people, you know, Jian Li is our tea consultant. She's written five books. She teaches in the university. She works with the producers. What does that mean was amazing to me to see that in action, how she, uh, how she goes in the garden and assesses with all of her senses what's going on. Um, is there fertilizer in use? Is the environment good for tea? Not just the climate and the things that are out of control, but uh, how is the spacing? How is the biodiversity? Um, how she goes in and watches the productions and chats with the producers as they produce the tea, how she works with them to help them improve. Um, paying close attention to the temperature of the walk, to the state of the tea as it's withering or drying or in between processes. It was all really amazing. Probably the most amazing was the way she can use taste to really get, close the loop, let's say. So she'll get to the, the end of the process and she's tasting it and then she can go back with everything she's taken in up to that point and close the loop with the producer and they can work together to improve. This was really amazing to me. And we met several producers who were brought into our network of producers because uh, they, they share the same ethic, the dedication to really great quality tea, which is fundamental. Everything from there she can work with and work to improve. That was just amazing to watch. And that is kind of my long, long-term goal is to become maybe half as good as that, that would be good enough for me. So listen, I'd like to thank you for having me. It's been a real pleasure talking with you all today. Uh, I hope you learned a lot. And if there's any other questions that uh, we didn't cover in this interview, please don't hesitate to leave a comment down below and we'll do our best to answer them in the future. Until then, happy sipping.